Not one Christian ever has produced evidence. He didn't either, nor can you. No one can. It doesn't exist. That's not the I debate I demand tonight. that anybody, anybody in this room who calls yourself a Christian, if you think you have scientific evidence to indicate you're God, bring it. You ain't got it. I win. 46% of Americans believe in the creationist view. God created humans in the present form at one time in the last 10,000 years. Does that just shock you that so many people still think that? Yes, it does. Shock you? It doesn't shock me, but it's pretty troubling. How about the recent push to implement intelligent design in school curriculums? That's, it's very dangerous. bad. It's dangerous. very dangerous. Dangerous. You, do, so, you don't mess with, with, with the truth. You just don't mess with it. Well, do we know the truth? Well, well we so certainly know that the, the universe was created a long time ago. Intelligent design <laughs> is, as the saying goes, dumb. In 2007, WorldNet Daily published an article stating, atheists are making a concerted effort to win the youth of America and the world. Hundreds of websites and blogs on the internet seek to convince and convert adolescents, endeavoring to remove any residue of theism from their minds and hearts by packaging atheism as the choice of a new generation. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. The idea of deep time, of this of billions of years, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your, your worldview just becomes, your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Charles Darwin, who everybody just seems to be a fan of in 2020, said, and I quote, Often a cold shudder has run through me, and I have asked myself whether I have devoted my life to a fantasy. Do you really think it's logical and rational to take a sticker with that man's name and put it on the back of your car and be proud to represent a man who thought he was living in fantasy land? And yeah, let's go back to Columbine in Colorado. The Columbine shooters wrote before they died that what they did in killing their fellow students and teachers they did it because they were taught evolution at the Columbine High School. They decided that their fellow students and teachers were inferior and therefore they had a right to blow them away. This is the consequences of evolution. Columbine High School, April 20th, 1999. Its deadly legacy still echoes today. Middle school, they have at least two down. October 21st, 2013, a Nevada boy, only 12, shoots and kills a teacher, wounds two students, then takes his own life. Police find pictures of the Columbine killers on the boy's cell phone. All the suspects were inspired by or somehow tied to the Columbine tragedy when Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold hunted down and killed 12 students and a teacher in cold blood. Richard Dawkins recently said that religion poisons the mind. Really, is that why 97% of school shootings are carried out by atheists? Yet Christians have their minds poisoned according to you, yet Christians have never committed such an act? Why would you say that Christians have their minds poisoned, yet atheists lead the world in suicide, school shootings, alcohol abuse, and drug abuse, and you want me to believe that religion is what poisons the mind. Video diaries, journals, police interrogations where the Columbine killers often emerged. Here's that Minnesota suspect talking to police in May. My number one idol is Eric Harris. Remember Columbine! He was arrested in this t-shirt. 
they're looking for things that uh, align with whatever their perceived grievances. They have taken an unusual fascination in Columbine and other large-scale uh, horrific attacks. The modern era of active shooter events really began with Columbine. Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. So many wonderful, you know, free-thinking people here, a lot of people that are interested in all sorts of different issues. I came out today uh, for, for reason and for free, free thought. Uh, can you explain your fantastic ensemble for me? Uh, I get mistaken for this mythical creep uh, being Jesus all the time, but it's really just me. And the biggest problem that I've noticed with atheists is that they don't really come asking questions. They're not curious people. They're actually anti-creation. This is saying that, you know, Obama is not going to make any kind of legislation or, or any push to, to teach our kids in, in early earth or young earth creationism. If they didn't believe it, they wouldn't care. They would literally be off living their own life, doing what they enjoy. But the fact that they're so triggered by it means that they know it's true and it aggravates them. It penetrates deep. Truth always does. Truth hurts. If I believed that God exists and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it. Aaron Ra recently said, if it was the God of the Bible, someone asked him, if it was the God of the Bible, and it was proved to be the God of the Bible, would you serve him? He said, I would not serve it. Talk about hatred for God. Wouldn't serve it. A God that's deceiving us, you know, that's not necessary. Maybe God is bored sitting up there in the clouds and likes to mess with us. They go out on the street, these atheists, and they hold up signs. And they say, like, free thought, good without God, and, and they hold up all these signs. Do you know how ridiculous that would look if we did that? Look at me, everybody. I believe in science. Like, who's going to take you seriously if you do that? Like, that's weird, isn't it? But it's because there, no alpha male would ever do that. They're an organization. They're a group of people. They all tend to think the same way. And matter of fact, atheist churches are opening up everywhere. The atheist church is launching 35 new services in cities across the world. There's ones in New Zealand, Hungary, France, the UK, and 16 here in the US. What's your background? Were you raised in a religious family? Did you go to church? Recently, I've, I've just been uh, de-baptized, so I have the actual certificate oh, really? to show that I've been de-baptized. How'd you get de-baptized? Atheism, remember, is a very small demographic. They only consist of about five to seven percent of the entire world's population. They're very, very small, but yet they lead the world in the worst statistics that you can possibly lead the world in. That's depression, medication intake, suicide, and school shootings. They'll say, well, believing in Jesus is like believing in Lord of the Rings. Well, why is it that nobody's writing against Lord of the Rings? Why is it that nobody's writing books against Santa Claus? Why is it that there are millions of people who make it their mission to write against somebody who they claim is nothing more than a fantasy? So why are you out here today? To let the religious right know that they got to know where they end and we begin. They're so mad. It's like, why don't you just calm down for a minute and let's talk about things like a rational human being. Maybe we can get to the bottom of why you feel like the way that you feel. And maybe that's probably the reason you don't believe in God. Not because of the evidence. It's because of the way that you feel. There's another atheist believer named Sam Harris. And I say believer because this is a religion. You have to have faith that there's a big bang because you've never seen it. There's no evidence of it. But Sam Harris in 2006, he said this, if I could wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. And what a disgusting freak. Oh, I can't wait, this guy's a reprobate. Because evolution is true, and because everything can create itself out of nothing, and because there is no God that's needed for anything, therefore we're just on our own, we can, we've sprouted up these new people that call themselves atheists, and they've de decided to live their life and define themselves by this term. Meaning they don't define themselves by what they believe in or what they like. They've decided to label themselves by what they don't believe in, supposedly. So what they've done is they've labeled themselves by something like a non-stamp collector. 
So take for example that uh, I don't like stamps, I don't believe in them, and I don't want to collect them. So I've came up with a term that I can now define myself by not collecting stamps. It really doesn't make much sense except for unless it really bothered me and it hit me on a personal level. And that's kind of what the concept of God has done to these people. It's affected them in so much of a way that they've now labeled themselves anti-God. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion, this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. So the Big Bang Theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton. So everything you see in this room, just imagine folks, it was all condensed down to a single proton, smaller than that, and then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the size of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. Who here thinks that's just logical and scientific? Explosions don't create natural law and order. They create chaos. But yet we have unchanging laws. Where did these laws come from? Where did they arise? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Yet in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from that tiny point to something billions of miles across. That's millions of times faster than the speed of light. It's not even scientifically possible. You know, 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on Earth right now. So for somebody to believe that those gallons of water were all condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton, that takes great faith. That takes great belief. Get this too. What if I said nothing caused something behind this piano to explode? What if I said nothing caused it? You'd say, man, that's crazy. That's weird. But that's literally what they believe. They believe that nothing exploded and that there was no God, so nothing had to cause nothing to explode. That is bizarre. Big Bang Theory is just a reminder that these people have decided what truth is, and they will use any explanation that does not include God. And the fact that the Big Bang is all they can come up with, it just is a reminder to me that there is no other explanation except that there is a God and that this is his creation. Like, what if I said nothing caused something over here to explode? Okay, it's highly unlikely. No, it's impossible. I would say it's highly unlikely. I would not say impossible. Okay. So you think it's possible that nothing could cause something to explode? Um, I would say, is there a chance? Yeah. Because again, I, I don't exercise absolute certainty. Are you absolutely certain of that? <laughs> Do you think artificial intelligence always requires a designer? I, yeah. Um, but intelligence doesn't. Like actual intelligent beings don't require a designer. So, we don't know. Your, your statement, you said atheists believe something came from, uh, from nothing. That's, that's not accurate. Um, I, I don't recall any ever, ever any atheist specific. I can name 10 right now that say that something came from nothing. Do you really believe that something came from nothing? Yes. Here's another one for you. You can't resist a headline that from the mail. Monkeys who sailed 900 miles across the Atlantic. Intrepid monkeys, again, according to scientists, made an improbable sea voyage from Africa to South America on a raft, picture it, on a raft 34 million years ago. They're saying that the only way they could have got there is climbing on a little, little raft. Evolutionists also claim that monkeys, because monkeys had to have somehow gotten to South America from Africa. That's what evolutionary theory states, and, and they have a problem figuring out how, so their best conclusion, that their best scientists have come up with, is this idea that monkeys surfed across the ocean, <laughs> across the ocean to a land anew over in South America. 
Now that has a lot of problems. There's tides out there. You know, they probably get blown off their surf. Whoever, who has ever seen a monkey surf? I don't even think they can. I didn't believe you, Matt. I, honestly, when you just said that, because I never heard this before, I was like, no one believes this. No one in the right mind. So I Googled it. Look at this, nationalgeographic.com. Long ago, about 36 million years before today, a raft of monkeys found themselves adrift in the Atlantic. I mean, can you believe this? This is really what they believe? This is crazy. It's CNN.com, prehistoric monkeys rafted across the Atlantic. Are you kidding me, Matt? Some things come to my mind immediately. First, what would ever possess a group of monkeys to find anything of a platform and take to sea. Secondly, how did they survive? Now, I did a little background on this, and if you rode a canoe, you'd move at about three miles per hour. That's if you rode. And you would make it across in, the, in a straight line, which is not possible, by the way, if, if you're floating, from Africa to South America, it would take you a minimum of 65 days rowing. Now, these monkeys have no way to propel themselves. They're bobbing around out there like a cork in the, in the ocean, and that brings to mind the perils that one experiences at sea. How about gales, hurricanes, uh, Euroclidons, as they were called? Even if they survived that, what did they eat? Now supposing they became cannibals and ate each other. Okay, perhaps they could survive for a while, but what did they drink? They're freshwater animals. They don't drink salt water. Given all of that, even if they managed to survive all of that, there are things such as sharks, which even atheists believe in, and they tend to feed. And when they see something that uh, draws their attention, as uh, floating objects tend to do, they come up and they investigate. And they investigate by hitting it first. So I can imagine all these monkeys flopping around in the water, trying to get back to their raft and becoming a, uh, uh, quite a uh, consumption for whatever shark was happened to be in the water. So is it possible? No. Is it probable? Absolutely not. So with that said, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. The surfing monkey theory is so hilarious to me. I'm almost embarrassed even talking about it. But the thing is, we have to talk about it because they're actually promoting this in so-called science books today. And it's just a reminder that these people, whenever there's evidence, you know, which is what science is supposed to be based off, that there is a creator, if that whenever they find evidence that disproves evolution, they go to just crazy theories like the surfing monkey theory and they come up with stuff like that and we're supposed to take them serious and you know we're supposed to let them intimidate us into silence on what we believe when they're coming up with stuff like that i find it insulting and it's embarrassing that we even have to address these type of things but anything's acceptable as long as it doesn't include god today monkeys are fairly smart so i mean i don't see why it wouldn't be possible Squids and octopuses have a different genetic build than any other creature in the world. So they couldn't, scientists have come to the conclusion that they couldn't have come from any other sea creature. So here's what evolutionary theory states about how they got here. Evolution says, or evolutionists claim, it says one plausible explanation in our view is that the genes are likely new extraterrestrial imports to Earth. These scientists declare that, quote, the squid eggs hitched a ride to Earth on the back of asteroids. That is what evolution teaches, folks. I am not kidding. I don't know if you've ever tried to catch a moving vehicle, a vehicle that's moving faster than you. Let's say a train. When we were kids, we lived near a railroad track about a couple miles away enough to be an attractive nuisance, and every once in a while we'd try to hop the freights. Sometimes they'd come through slow. If they were running five miles an hour, you could jump on them. If they were running faster than that, you didn't dare. 
Now, I don't know how fast an asteroid moves, but it moves faster than a freight train. I'm not sure how squids and octopi even got to outer space to begin with. They're aquatic animals, and uh, they do process oxygen from the water. So now they're out of water. They're on the, assuming that somehow they got in this asteroid, how we don't know, maybe they have asteroid stops in space that we don't know about. And they climb aboard and now they're speeding through space, just happened to be on a trajectory leading them to Earth. Why do you suppose they have ceramic tiles on the space shuttle? They're there to keep it from burning up when it comes into our atmosphere. I submit to you that if they came in on an asteroid, fully exposed to the elements, coming through our atmosphere would turn them into a piece of ash instantaneously. So the process that they want you to believe is so absurd that I can't imagine anyone would believe this, but there are some that believe that scientists and their ideas and their work is infallible. And to that I say, nonsense. This idea of you know, an octopus coming to Earth through a comet or riding on an asteroid or something like that, to me it just seems crazy. I mean, if they could survive a trip through space on an asteroid, then shouldn't they be adaptable enough that they could survive on land as well as water? So shouldn't we have some kind of relations to the octopus living on land somewhere? Yet there is none, which tells me the evidence says that that theory is completely baseless. It's just something, you know, to me, the octopus is evidence of a creator and it is evidence that completely defeats what they're teaching, and, but they, they, they're allowed to come up with these crazy theories that cannot be proved. They flew here on the back of comets. That's what you believe. You believe that squid and octopus eggs were attached on the back of comets. They flew and they landed in the ocean and then they became mortal enemies with one another. That's the logic that you bring to the table with evolution. I do need to look that up if that's true. Yeah, that's, that's what evolution teaches, is that monkeys actually got on rafts. Recently, they did a study on man's anatomy in, in regards to the face of man. And they, they were wondering, since we supposedly evolved from monkeys, how we got facial hair, or how we ended up having facial hair that grows out down here. Evolution literally teaches that our face and that our hair was created as a cushion and that we were actually punched to the point where natural selection had to create a cushion in our face. That is weird. Have you ever watched a boxer walk into the ring? What's the first thing that the coach does? They smear Vaseline right over your eyebrows. Do you know why? Because that's hair. And when you get punched in the face and it hits the hair, your hair is very sharp and it will cut into your skin and you'll bleed into your eye and the fight has to be stopped. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And I've actually grown facial hair out in a fight. And guess what? I got cut on my chin. It's the only scar that I have on my chin is from hair. It didn't protect me at all. It did the exact opposite thing. It actually was worse. So whoever invented the theory didn't have any logic or any ability to think by, hmm, let's see, what would happen if I got punched in the face with a beard? Well, I just Googled it and it, it's up on life science. Did men's beards evolve to absorb a punch to the jaw? This is ridiculous. They'll believe in Bigfoot and aliens and hollow earth, that we live in a hologram, but creation? No way, that's crazy. I'll believe that monkeys got hit in the face until they grew beards before that. It is shocking that in 2020, with all the information that we have and the ability to Google things, that people even believe in evolution. They say that the reason that we lost our ape hair is because apes started sewing and knitting clothes. So they didn't need their hair anymore. 
think about it, people. Logic, come on. Why did it start needing to wear a jacket? An ape today doesn't need a jacket, no matter where it lives. It can live in the tropics. You can put it in a zoo in the city. You can put it in the Arctic. They live out in the frost in Japan, up in the high mountains, and they just sit there. They don't need clothes. That's just ridiculous to think that they started wearing clothes when they don't need them, and that's why we lost our body fur. That's what they believe. Man, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools who turned the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man and serve the creature rather than the creator. That's what these people are. So does anybody actually really believe this? Like, or, or are these just theories that they throw out and hope, you know, somebody actually, you know, takes that as law? These people are teaching that we evolved from these primates. Primitive superstition. Yeah, that's primitive superstition. Primates becoming humans, fish to fishermen. They scoff, they mock at you, but they don't even know what evolution teaches. Duck-billed dinosaurs once crossed the ocean. The first duck-billed dinosaur fossil discovered in Africa. Because Africa was isolated by the deep oceans at that time, duck-billed dinosaurs must have crossed hundreds of miles of open water. Where's their source for that? Well, here's kind of interesting in this article that I'm reading. Here's who they quote as a source. Sherlock Holmes said, <laughs> that's a joke, okay? He's a, he's a fictional character. Sherlock Holmes said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. I mean, this just came out. This is November 7th, 2020. And here's the thing. In order for evolution to be true, this stuff had to happen. I don't know if these dinosaurs would have been eating fish on the way or... <laughs> and it's absurd, some things that people will believe and yet they'll reject the Bible. The tricky thing about Schweitzer's work is that she needs to get her hands on the insides of dinosaur bones, which means literally breaking the bones apart. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> You'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. Critics said their samples might have been contaminated. It's impossible for these materials to exist in the ground for millions and millions of years. So this disproves evolution and proves that these materials are simply the remnants of creatures that died approximately 4,500 years ago in a great worldwide flood called Noah's Flood. 
Dinosaur soft tissue is another example of the scientists ignoring the evidence. Here we have evidence that they're not as old as they say, and yet we're supposed to ignore it. Because obviously, if there's soft tissue, it must last 65 million years because we know dinosaurs were 65 million years ago. Well, are you sure about that? Because the evidence is saying something else. And the truth is, they only accept evidence that lines up with what they've already decided is true and they ignore the rest, but we're all supposed to just accept that as science because they told us, even though they haven't shown us and, and though we're seeing opposite. dinosaur soft tissue and we keep finding it matter of fact when they, when you ask the scientists to find these things they actually say that it's so rampant you can literally go into a museum pull out a drawer where these dinosaur bones have been for hundreds of years break them open and find dinosaur DNA and material that's inside of them that's how rampant it is so just the fact that we have found dinosaur soft tissue just within the past century proves that the earth cannot be millions of years old a lot of atheists when they had heard this they discredited the the person who came out with it a fellow evolutionist. Even if you were to put dinosaur soft tissue inside of an airtight jar that was in another airtight jar and another airtight jar, deep time will always cause things to deteriorate. So there's no way that it could have lasted 65 million years. It's lucky that it even lasted a thousand years. I mean, you look at animals that die out in nature today, they decay almost right away. Well, here's what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Now, remember, Job apparently never saw a dinosaur, according to these people. Job 40, verse 15, it says, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. So, the Bible says that whatever this creature is, it was made with Job. It was the same time frame. He eateth grass as an ox. And they say, huh, see, we gotcha. That's not a dinosaur. It ate grass. Remember when evolution said that 55 million years ago, grass evolved. It was the first time they had ever seen grass. Dinosaurs never saw grass. And then they decided, we're gonna start investigating to see what dinosaurs ate. They dug up dinosaur feces, which I don't know how it lasted 65 million years, but they discovered dinosaur feces and they tested the feces of the dinosaur. And guess what the dinosaur ate? Dinosaur dung is full of grass. That falsifies grass evolving after dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived 65 million years. Grass evolved 55 million years ago. Dinosaurs ate grass. Which one is it? Falsified again. Grass evolved way before that, according to their own theory now. But they didn't find grass in the fossil records, so therefore grass didn't exist. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. It moved its tail like a cedar. You guys know of any creature that moves its tail and it's as big as a cedar tree. There's nothing like that out there except a brachiosaur or a dinosaur. God is nowhere in the law of thermodynamics. But you didn't, you weren't really able to tell me what those were. Fair enough. To be very clear, science, not my area at all. However, there is a countless number of possibilities. Free thought compares both sides of an equation. Evolution is the only theory protected by law, which means that you're actually not allowed to free think outside of evolution. If you have to have laws to protect your scientific theory from scrutiny, what does that tell you about your theory? Are you really allowed to be a free thinker? Now this is actually anti-education because to have a good educational technique, to have critical thinking, you have to teach both sides of the issue and allow the student to decide for themselves which one they will believe. What we cannot do in a lab is we cannot create life. We've, we've tried every possible method, and we can't do it with all of the most high-tech instruments in the world. So you think that what couldn't come alive in a laboratory, could, under controlled environment, could come to life in a violent, prehistoric environment? Saying it's not 
possible right now it doesn't mean it's not possible. So you're putting your trust in something we have not yet discovered. I'm just not, I'm not putting my trust in the theistic explanation of God. Um, but you're looking for some it, explanation in the future. Uh, yeah. So you're putting your trust in something we have not yet discovered. I, I don't want to ha necessarily have absolute certainty or claim absolute certainty on any position. Really, as you use cause and effect reasoning, starting with the humans and argue back where did humans come from and where did life come from, ultimately they do believe that minerals by some random chance process, probably in water, uh, came together to form life. Now, there's a big contradiction to that because water destroys biological uh, molecules. Uh, the, the big contradiction is that also oxygen, if molecules are trying to form in the presence of oxygen or in the presence of water, then uh, they are destroyed faster than they could be made. Life cannot come from non-life. That's a law of science. It's the law of biogenesis that life cannot spontaneously create itself. And so according to evolution, or according to atheism, life would have had to come about in the water, DNA. Well, we know that DNA uh, is destroyed by water. Water destroys DNA. Again, oxygen and water destroy things like DNA molecules. The whole idea of evolutionary thinking is simply falls apart when you take a look at it and look deeply. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. So we're seeing the opposite of what they say happens. What are we supposed to believe? Fairy tale pseudoscience or what we actually observationally see? I mean, I'm going to go with what I see. That's why I was an evolutionist and now I believe in creation. Because when I look under the microscope and I go, wow, the exact opposite of, is occurring of what I was taught and told in school. And what I'm seeing is degradation everywhere I look. What other model exists? Well, there's only one model that explains this well. That's the creation model. And that's what I go with. I go with what we see and what we can test. It's the only thing that makes logical sense. Unless I want to remain in ignorance and stay an atheist, I can't do it. And genetics is where the war against evolution is actually won. And it's won with genetic entropy. Genetic entropy is one of the single strongest modern scientific arguments against evolution. Because in genetic entropy, which is really the second law of thermodynamics as applied to genetics, as you copy information, you will inevitably destroy it, lose it, corrupt it. That's exactly what occurs in genetics. When you copy previously existing information, you have only two choices. You can either copy it perfectly or imperfectly. And so what happens is over time, genetic information is lost, it is not gained. We're seeing that mutations are causing cancer and disease and degradation going on inside the human body. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. It proves absolutely that we started with perfect genetic information and it's being lost over time. Today, because of the Human Genome Project completed in April of 2003, we know that we're losing one to two percent of our genetic information as human beings per generation. Now, we are the approximately 250th generation since creation, roughly 6,000 years ago. The truth is, we shouldn't even be here. The amount of information that's being lost should, in fact, have caused us to become extinct. You either have to believe that somebody created the universe, which is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics, or that matter and energy created itself from nothing and that it poofed into existence magically. And so atheists will often accuse Christians of believing in magic. But here's the thing, anybody that believes that matter and energy could create itself believes in magic by default. That is a magic act. Do you think like an explosion out of chaos produced order? I, I don't know. Do you believe in the Big Bang? Yeah. That's as far as I've uh, uh, understood it, yes. That's an explosion out of chaos. Yeah. Do you think it produced order in life? I think it's possible. Now, do I think it's likely? Probably not. Let's grant your argument that somehow nothing could create everything. Well, if that's the case, then how do you justify the precision of the creation. I mean, 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on Earth alone. Do you think all of those were crammed down to an infinitesimal amount of space, all those gallons of water? See, I, I, again, I, I don't have the answer, and that's why I think... But you believe in the Big Bang. Right. So you're putting, you're, you're putting confidence in something that you don't even know.
So the second law of thermodynamics is an excellent argument proving that evolution is not true. It proves that you start with the complex and end up with simple. It's exactly opposite to what evolutionary theory, or as I put it, evolutionary religion says. Well, the dust that we see in space actually proves creation. Now, there's two aspects to that. If we are taking a look outside the solar system, out into the galaxy and in between galaxies, the dust in the solar system, which we can measure, is being pulled by gravity mostly into the sun because the sun represents 98% of all the mass in the solar system. And that dust is being pulled in, but the dust does get accumulated and pulled in by the gravity of planets as well. But if the solar system were as old as evolutionists claim, then it should be dust free. The fact of the matter is there's plenty of dust out there. The, the rings around Neptune, the rings around Saturn are lumpy. Now, what does that tell you? It means that they're not old. It proves that they are young. As a matter of fact, the rings that you think about are actually very active. And the rings that are closest, for instance, to Saturn are actually being sucked into the planet and being destroyed. The rings at the outer edge are being thrown off into space by centrifugal forces. If the rings around Saturn and Neptune uh, were in fact old, they would be completely smoothed out by now, but they are lumpy. God flooded the world 4,400 years ago and killed every single living thing on the planet. And the only thing that survived was two of each kind uh, of animal on Noah's Ark, and his family got off that boat and they repopulated the world. The reason that they say monkeys had to surf from Africa to South America, when you ask them, where's your evidence for that? Because I just say, it's in your imagination. They'll say, no, we have evidence. What's the evidence? Well, they're like, well, we, we found a monkey that was trying to get on a vegetation map and it was fossilized and it was over in an area where it shouldn't have been. You're proving the flood, folks. It was trying to survive. Like, why else would it try to be hopping on some vegetation mat unless it was being buried by a flood? Whole whales have been found throughout the United States on the top of mountains. Now, how do you think they got there? I wonder how. Here's the thing about whales. Because they're so heavy and fat, when they die, they float. And when they float, their carcasses start immediately being eaten. They would be eaten by birds, by sharks. You can watch it on YouTube videos even today. They watch a whale that dies. It's being consumed rapidly. And then they get beached. They fall into a beach and then, and then crabs and everything else eat them on top of it. Their carcass doesn't last long. Even their bones are corroded away fairly, fairly quickly. So because their carcasses degrade so quickly and so fast, there's only one way that we should ever find fossils of a whale preserved, and that would be from a flood. They would have to be buried very quickly. Now, why would we find whales on a mountain? Why would they be on hills at all? The only way that they could possibly be there is from Noah's flood. There is no other reason you would ever find a whale on a mountain unless it happened from Noah's flood. That's it, there is no other option. If you were to step outside right now and you look at the ground, what do you see? you're going to see places where animals burrow down in. Groundhog holes, snake holes, you're going to see tree roots everywhere, you're going to see trees growing. Things are constantly going down into the ground. In between the layers of the Grand Canyon, if they were slow to form, we should expect to find animal holes. Because if you look outside right now, animals are constantly burrowing down into the earth. They're constantly burrowing holes down into the dirt. In between the layers of the Grand Canyon, we don't see any animal holes. If those layers were exposed for a period of time, animals would have burrowed into those layers. Trees would have grown in the layers, plants. Wouldn't you expect to find roots in the layers? Never find them. You know what that proves is that the layers were all deposited at the same exact time. If a layer is exposed, rain is going to fall. Etching into the sedimentary rock a V-shaped erosion mark. Now that V-shaped erosion mark would be preserved when the next layer of mud came in on top and filled it in. But we don't see these V-shaped erosion marks. You will find that some layers are absolutely perfectly flat. 
There is nothing in between them. But the fact of the matter is that there are many things about the Grand Canyon that prove that this is not slow and gradual accumulation over millions and billions of supposed years. In fact, it is a result of one year-long worldwide flood. What about fossilized seashells up on the top of Mount Everest? How'd they get there? Evolutionists say, well, they were, they were pushed up through millions of years of plate tectonics. Plate tectonic shifts put them up there. Well, let's, let's go back to fantasy land and pretend that's true. The clams that are found there are closed. Now they have a particular protein that's in them that when they die, it gets released and it, uh, it forces them to open. There's no way they can stay closed. These clams are massive. They're bigger than human beings. So the clams themselves would have easily been opened if they were just under, let's say, one or two feet of mud. They must have been buried under massive amounts of sediment. How could there be clams both buried and on the surface of Mount Everest that have not yet opened when they died? The only way that that is explained is from Noah's flood. There are no other options. Polystratophossils, you got trees that broke off in the flood. And it, just like at Mount St. Helens, they'll come up and they'll float for quite a long time. Then they get waterlogged and they'll turn upside down, they'll go down and they'll lay in the sediment. They found that at Mount St. Helens. The sediment will form around it all the way up. You mean to tell me that them trees are gonna stand there for millions of years while the sediment forms around it? They teach that these rock layers are millions and millions of years old, but how can that be if they can find trees that are going through multiple layers of these supposedly millions and millions of year old rocks? That doesn't make any sense. And not only do they find upright trees, because a lot of evolutionists will try to you know, scramble and say, oh, well, maybe it just grew through those layers of rocks somehow, which is impossible. But, you know, they actually find upside down polystrate fossils, which just completely debunks that the Earth is millions of years old. They have a real problem with this, and they want to tell you that the trees just stood there and they were straight up and the sediment formed around it. But no tree does that. You can't demonstrate that. You can't test it. You can't prove it. It's not science. There's no way that a tree is going to stand there for that long. And they find these trees broke off upside down or sections of them in the desert. That shows that there was a worldwide flood that could fossilize and pick up those trees and rapidly fossilize those things. Ethan, it's not hard to figure out that the law of cause and effect states that for everything that comes into existence, there is a cause. And so therefore, the cause of the universe, if it created time, must be outside of time. If it created space, it must be outside of space. If it created matter, says the law of cause and effect. So where does it specifically state that in order for this to be created, it, something outside of it has to create it? Do you, think unconsciousness, do you think unconsciousness is going to cause consciousness? Have you ever observed that? No, I haven't. Why would you believe that? So you'd have to believe that it was a conscious being that created consciousness. Because remember, the law of cause and effect and the first law of thermodynamic state, that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted. So if there was no matter and energy, which all of science agrees, that at one point there was nothing, either somebody created it or nobody created it and it poofed into existence magically. That's what the Big Bang even is, it's a poof, it's an imagination. The chances for a single protein, for a single protein, just one, is 10 to the 164th power. Who here thinks that 10 to the 164th power could happen by chance? Trillions of times over, right? Because there's trillions of proteins. Those are impossible chances. And for all that to have come about without a God, I think it's impossible. Everything's tending towards chaos. The sun's getting smaller, the moon's getting further from Earth, the Earth is slowing down. They always say, give it more time and everything will happen. Like, you know, you can have fish to fishermen over time, bacteria to biologists. Just give us more time. Time is their God. But it takes longer than that, Ken. That's okay. the problem. You won't allow us the time. You, you always tell us that the time is the religion. It's not yeah. enough time, Ken. We need okay. more time. Okay, let's give them more time. The sun's burning down. The moon's getting further from Earth. Earth's slowing down. Things are heading to a point where we can't even live. So just give it more time. 
if we give it more time, it's going to be bad. Evolution can't work. It can't work with time. It can't work without time. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. We have an obligation to help our brothers and sisters. And yes, an atheist actually is a brother and sister by blood. Are they part of the spiritual family? No, they need to be grafted into us. Then they become our spiritual brother. But right now they're outside and it's up to us to bring them in. And what's happened is they've been diluted and lied to. And they're mad at us for telling them that they were lied to. Why? Why are you mad at us? It makes no sense. You're mad, you're hating me, and I'm really going out of my way to tell you the truth, why, so you can hate me? Of course not. I'm doing everything in my power to tell you that you were lied to. And I'm coming out of, going out of my way to show you how you were lied to. And I want to bring you to the truth of what's really going on. And nothing is more of a destruction of that than the thought of evolution. Their books change every 10 years. They change the dates on everything. They change everything. And they'll tell you, oh, it's because we have more information now. No, it's because you've been falsified or you flopped on something and it has to be changed or, or else you're just going to be wrong forever. So what's really going on is the school is teaching you something by law that they have to and they don't allow any other theory in and it's protected by law so they don't allow any other model and then you've been indoctrinated in this just the same way that your teacher has so they don't grasp anything outside that they're not allowed to think outside the box even though they tell you go ahead you can think about whatever you want I'm a good teacher you can put on that test any answer you want yeah really then how come this one book is all you give me to study from and to give the answers from if you are really truthful you would have a blank test with maybe a couple generic questions that you would allow me to free think and give an answer to not out of one book but out of multiple books but but instead it's an indoctrination tool. Remember Rockefeller funded the academic society and said I don't want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. Why did he say that? Because the more we free think and the more that we think about things, we become an individual and we can think for ourselves. Why does the military want you when you're young and not old? Because you're never going to fall in line and be indoctrinated. They need you when you're ripe and young and your mind is easily indoctrinated. So here's how schools trick you. They come along and they throw a math class at you. Well, guess what? Math is a fact. It's true. Two plus two is four. I don't care where you go. And then they throw you in an English class. Well, everyone's speaking English. That must be true. And then they tell you about history and they explain things to you. And then they throw you in this random evolutionary class where everything's subjective and changes all the time and then mixed with truth and lies. And then all of a sudden to you, it's true because you, every other class you go to is true. So you're like, well, why would they lie to me? Obviously everything else is true, so therefore this is true. So you don't even question it. It's just given to you. It's just another book out of another book on the shelf and therefore it is true. So you've been indoctrinated and you can easily fall out of it, but it gets harder because you've got to remember, you've been taught this from junior high all those years and then through high school all those years and then you get into college and all those years. That is one hour out of every day of your life, all of those years of school, you think that's going to be easy to break with some guy walking up to you and saying evolution's a lie? You're going to be like, this dude's on crack. Evolution, what are you talking about? We see evolution all around us. The, a baby evolves into an adult. Grass evolves into corn. I mean, any, everything evolves. What are you talking about? So there's, there's so much of a hurdle for us to get over because th what we've done is we've made this generation of people that that are ingrained into thinking in only one way and evolution is the only way that there is and there's only one model and there's only one explanation there isn't there are more explanations and they can be answered now and there's more than one model and our model is so good it's never been seen before this good even 20 years ago it wasn't nearly as good as it is now I recommend people reading replacing Darwin it does replace the evolutionary model and it's a really good explanation as to why that model is not good and ours is superior you ask an evolutionist or an atheist what is the meaning of life? Just ask them that. And they'll respond back with, 
Well, my meaning of my life is whatever I make up. What they're admitting is that they're making up or make believing a purpose for life. They don't think there actually is any purpose. And so they say, well, I'll just make up purpose. That's make believe, folks. Why is it that some of the least religious places on earth are so sad that they need to take antidepressants every single day? I would plead that it's because without God, without a purpose in life, I think that man has to look at himself and say, what am I doing on this planet? Then you wonder why so many people commit suicide. Why am I here? How do I know that tree exists? How do I know this wall exists? How do I know this lamp exists? How do I know you exist? And then, because, you know, all I know exi that exists is evil. So if everything is evil, I must be evil. I must be a product of evil. I'm doing something good because I'm killing evil. That is what happens when you don't have God. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. You know what foolishness is? It's believing that everything in the universe came from nothing. That's foolishness. You know what foolishness is? Believing that we're related to monkeys and that we're also related to bananas and the grass at the same time. That's stupid. That's foolishness. There's many people that really believe that the earth is millions of years old and they really believe that they came from a dot that exploded magically out of nowhere. People really believe this stuff and they say that we believe in fairy tales. They just have no evidence to back it up. You know, dogs are still producing dogs, cats are still producing cats, and you know, obviously uh, there's variations within kinds, but you'll never find an intermediate fossil because they just don't exist because it's just not true. These people, like, it just goes to show they don't know the Bible. So, of course, they come at us when I bring these things up to them with the blanket statements that we've all heard a million times. They'll say, well, you know, must take a lot of faith there to think that a virgin could conceive there, buddy. You know what? These people think a rock conceived. <laughs> you know, and one guy I was in a debate a while ago with this guy, the raging atheist, and he goes, I don't know how anybody could have enough faith to believe that a Jewish man like Jesus would resurrect from the dead. And I'm just thinking, man, you, you think that every living cell came to life out of non-existence yeah. and from dead material to begin with. Yeah. You believe you and I and every other life form came to life out of non-existence. I believe Jesus died and resurrected. Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it again into myself. Yeah. And so Jesus had that power. But to say that you believe that every living life form resurrected from non-living material, that's crazy. That's madness. That's a greater resurrection than I believe in. They want to talk about Christianity being a fairy tale and being a phony story, but look at what they believe. You have to have a lot more faith to be an atheist than you do to be a Christian. Believing the gospel is easy. Believing that someone made everything here makes sense. But believing that a, a dot blew up and create everything, and two slugs crawled out of the primordial soup after it rained on the rocks for billions of years, married each other, and then made all the things that you see here. That's a fairy tale. You know, saying that a frog became a prince, that's a fairy tale. God is nowhere in the law of thermodynamics. But you didn't, you weren't really able to tell me what those were. Fair enough. To be very clear, science, not my area at all. I'd like to ask these people, would you ever do a debate on the existence of Santa Claus? Would you ever do a debate on the existence of Bugs Bunny or Elmer Fudd? 
They wouldn't do it. You know what that tells me? That my Lord is legitimate enough in their eyes that they feel like they have to spend their whole life fighting against him. And who defines their life by what they don't believe in? It's like, you know, when they say, I'm an atheist, just the word atheist is, is ridiculous. Just the word, because it literally means, I lack belief, that's what they say. It's just, I, I lack belief in God. Well, and you're gonna call yourself that? You might as well just say, well, I'm a non-stamp collector. I don't collect stamps. I could say, well, I'm a non-stamp collector. Just the word atheist is ridiculous. Just the word. And somebody wants to call themselves that? This guy I interviewed, he's like, yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head there, Mr. Powell. That's, wh that's how we define ourselves. Change your definition. Find something better to believe in. You know, they say, well, we don't have any beliefs. Is that your belief that you don't have beliefs? They define their life about disproving something that they think is a fantasy, quote unquote. They would never do the same with Bugs Bunny. They would never do the same with Lord of the Rings. They're like, believing in Jesus is like believing Lord of the Rings. Well, okay, let's do a three-hour debate on Lord of the Rings then. They won't do it because they know that God is legitimate enough to fight against. And by the way, the title of my message is God or Magic? Because remember, anybody that believes that natural causes could create themselves or that matter and energy could create itself believes in magic. That's magic. The, just think about the concept of the Big Bang. Poof! Magic! It's an imagination. That's all it is. It's a rabbit being pulled out of a hat. First law of thermodynamics. Scientific laws are on our side as the Christian. My, my theory is consistent with every law of science. Theirs, they have to make believe. You ask them. Ask an atheist sometime, what is the meaning of life? You guys ever asked an atheist that? You know what they always say? They always say, well, my meaning of my life is whatever I make up. Do you realize that they're admitting that they're making up or make-believing a purpose for life? That's make-believe. They say, oh, the Bible's primitive superstition. No, you know what primitive superstition is? Saying that we came from primitive primates back in primitive times millions of years ago. That is primitive superstition.